When we talk about vibrations of two atoms connected via a bond, what we're really referring to is movement back and forth of the atoms about some equilibrium position. As the atoms shift outward and inward, they're propelled by forces that pull them back toward the equilibrium position. This is analogous to the motion of a spring, which has an equilibrium position that it tends to want to occupy. If it's pushed or pulled out of that equilibrium position, it will vibrate about the equilibrium position until it eventually comes to a halt due to friction and other dampening factors like this. As it turns out, the stretching vibrations in molecules behave analogously to the back and forth stretching of a spring that you may be familiar with from physics. And while there are other types of vibrational motions, such as bending and wagging, that aren't as easy to treat using the spring type model as a pure stretch, the model of a chemical bond as a spring connected to two masses, the so-called harmonic oscillator model, is a useful one, as we'll see, for understanding the vibrational dynamics of molecules. More specifically, how the strength of the bond between the atoms and their two masses affect the vibrational frequency, which we'd like to be able to predict at least in a qualitative way in order to interpret and understand infrared spectra. The harmonic oscillator model is based on the idea that the bond has an equilibrium position. And we'll define that as the origin for each atom. Vibrations either pull the atoms apart from each other or push them in closer to each other. And both of these motions cause a deviation delta x of each atom from its equilibrium position. Hooke's law, which is a macroscopic law based on how springs behave, says that the force felt by each atom in this case to return to its equilibrium position is proportional to that deviation delta x. In other words, the farther the atoms are away from their equilibrium position, the stronger is their, the force on them to return to the equilibrium position. And this is consistent with our intuition, if you've ever messed around with the spring. Although we won't get into the math of this, the second equation on this slide shows us how the frequency of the vibration varies as a function of the type of atoms involved and the type of bond involved. Our main goal here is to understand how this equation tells us how the frequency varies as a function of mass and the strength of the bond. And there are two parameters involved here. The first is the force constant, K. K reflects the strength or stiffness of the bond. And for single bonds in organic molecules, we can actually write a typical value that doesn't depend on the identities of the atoms involved in the bond. This is obviously a little bit hand wavy, but it works quite well, as we'll see. And that value is 500,000 dynes per centimeter. You're probably unfamiliar with the unit dyne. A dyne is the gram centimeter equivalent of the newton. So where a newton is one kilogram meter per second squared, a dyne is one gram centimeter per second squared. Setting k equal to this value obviously involves a huge approximation that all bonds have the same strength with respect to vibrations, but we'll use a few test calculations here in a bit to verify that this does work pretty well. The other parameter in this equation is mu, a measure of the masses of the atoms m1 and m2. And while the force constant k reflects the strength of the bond, mu accounts for the masses of the atoms and how they affect frequency. Mu is equal to the sum of the two masses divided by their product. And we can actually write this another way that can make this number more intuitive. It's also equal to 1 over the first mass plus 1 over the second mass to the negative 1 power. Considering that this shows up in the denominator of the frequency equation, we can see that 1 over m1 plus 1 over m2 actually does show up under the square root sign in this equation, telling us that as the masses get bigger, the vibrational frequency goes down, a point we're going to return to here in a second. What the frequency equation tells us is that the frequency is proportional to the square root of the force constant and inversely proportional to the square root of the reduced mass. N sub A is Avogadro's number, and this appears here so that we can use, for example, atomic mass units from the periodic table and convert them to grams by multiplying by Avogadro's number. Let's apply this equation to the quick example of the vibrational frequency of HCl, a simple diatomic molecule. The masses involved here are 1.0 AMU, essentially, and 35.45 AMU for the chlorine atom on average. This means that the reduced mass is equal to 36.45, the sum of the two 
masses, divided by their product, which is, of course, 35.45. So you can see that the reduced mass here is going to come out darn near the mass of the hydrogen atom. To be exact, it's 1.028 AMUs. With a relatively small contribution due to the much larger chlorine atom, plugging in to the frequency equation, we obtain that the frequency here is 8.61 times 10 to the 13 hertz, which is in very good agreement with the experimentally measured value for the vibrational frequency of HCl. Although we haven't talked about them yet, I'll go ahead and express this number in wave numbers as well. It's 2,870 wave numbers, or per centimeter, and this is right smack in the middle of the infrared region. Let's unpack this equation a little more to understand how the vibrational frequency for a particular bond depends on the masses of the atoms involved and the bond strength. The strength of the bond in this equation is captured by K, the force constant. As the bond strength increases, K increases. Because K increases, the vibrational frequency increases. Not linearly, but as the square root of K. And the most obvious place where this shows up in infrared spectra, whose axes actually increase in frequency moving to the left, is that we find single bonds at relatively low frequencies. For example, the CC single bond is at a relatively low frequency. The CC double bond, which has at least to a very rough approximation double the force constant, shows up at a higher frequency. And the CC triple bond, which is three times, let's say, the force constant of the CC single bond shows up at an even higher frequency. As bond strength increases, vibrational frequency goes up. But that's not the only factor in play. One piece of evidence for this is that CH single bonds vibrate at a higher frequency than any carbon-carbon bonds. The masses of the atoms are modeled in the frequency equation by the reduced mass mu, and so as the masses of the atoms increase, mu increases as well. But since mu appears in the denominator of the right-hand side of this equation, as the masses of the atoms increase, vibrational frequency goes down. And this is why, for example, we observe that CH bonds vibrate at very high frequencies, while CC bonds are somewhat lower, followed by CN bonds and CO bonds. Oxygen is the heaviest atom here, and as the weight of the other atom decreases, as that atom gets lighter, we move to higher vibrational frequencies. These observations are consistent with a single mass model of the harmonic oscillator, such as you might see in physics. Watch what happens to the vibrational frequency as I decrease the mass of the block labeled 1 in this model. Notice that the frequency goes up considerably as that mass gets smaller. As I increase the mass from its original value, the vibrational frequency goes down considerably. In fact, we can also use this model to show the impact of the spring constant. So if I return the mass, to about two and a half kilograms, watch what happens when I alter the spring constant, increasing it to make the spring more stiff or the bond stronger. Notice that the vibrational frequency now has gone up considerably. If I lower the spring constant to make the spring looser or the bond weaker, the vibrational frequency slows down quite a bit. This is modeling the dependence of the vibrational frequency on K, the force constant, or as it's labeled here, the spring constant.